When you look at the popular music culture, there are many people you can point to as being incredibly important. You've got your people like Barry Gordy and Max Martin and Bob Dylan and Michael Jackson. And of course, everything always goes back to the Beatles. But the more I research bands I enjoy, there's one person who seems to be at the heart of so much music that I love and who seemed to be a guiding force in music culture for at least a generation. So, this is his story, the story of Rick Rubin, and why I think he deserves to be considered the father of modern American music, or at least deserves to be in the conversation. If you like this video, please give it a like, consider subscribing so you don't miss out on more stories from music history. And if you want to contribute to these videos getting better, I do have memberships open on this channel. It's like three bucks a month. You don't get a whole lot. Can't really recommend you do it, but you'll get early access to videos. I will shout you out in the videos. And I'm probably going to run polls for members where you can vote on the next topic that I cover. So if any of that sounds interesting or worth it to you, there will be a link in the description for you to sign up for that. On March 10th, 1963, Linda, an art teacher, and Michael, a wholesale shoe salesman, gave birth to Frederick J. Rubin in Long Beach, New York. I mean, Michael wasn't the one giving birth. That was that was kind of Linda's thing, but you know, they were they were his parents. In interviews, Rick talked about how his family was super tight knit and warm and welcoming. He said, quote, They gave me the confidence to do things that other people felt were more challenging, end quote. But he did talk about how they put a whole bunch of pressure on him. He said they kind of that saw him as this person he wasn't, almost like a perfect person, and they put a ton of expectation and weight on him to the point where he got a 99 instead of a 100 on this like standardized test, and they were pretty disappointed about that. He started playing guitar when he was in ninth grade and befriended the head of the audiovisual department who kind of taught him how to play some rudimentary chords. From an early age, he was really drawn to the art of writing a good pop song. He, of course, loved the Beatles. He said they were all around him when he was growing up, and just being immersed in the Beatles and their songs imprinted on him what a good song sounded like, even well before he knew he was interested in that. He definitely leaned more in a pop direction, liking the Beatles and bands like that, rather than the Rolling Stones. He said he never really got into them. He even told the New York Times, quote, I loved the Monkees. They had all the best songwriters, end quote. Much later, he talked with Lex Friedman about the importance of music, something that he started learning when he was really young. He said, quote, music has the ability to bring us so much depth in our soul that's hard to access any other way. He went through a period of not really listening to music where he got way more into stand-up comedy, but then in junior high he heard the Ramones for the first time and fell in love with punk music. But he said he was kind of the only punk in his high school, so he was alone on this punk island and gravitated towards the hip-hop kids, so that was where he found his first musical community. He told NPR, quote, Well, I listened to mostly rock music, and I felt like hip-hop was like an extension of rock music when it was done well. I felt like it was in line with punk rock and maybe hard rock more than it was in line with R&B, which I never really liked. So since he was now a fan of punk music and the head of the audiovisual department had taught him a few rudimentary chords, he knew that you only needed a few chords to start a band and make music. He and a few friends started a punk band that they called The Pricks, and that was when he first started writing songs. But when he saw Run DMC perform, that changed his entire life, and he became super fascinated by hip-hop, specifically producing hip-hop. So Rick got more and more involved in the hip hop community, becoming a staple in the clubs and often being the only white person there. But he said he didn't feel out of place because they all bonded over their shared love of music. That was the thing they were passionate about beyond like race lines. It was always about the music and he was just as passionate as they were. So they kind of welcomed him into it. It's worth noting that that's from his perspective as the white guy there. I. I don't really have the perspective of the other people there who thought maybe he was intruding into their culture. I don't know, just saying what he said. After high school, Rick enrolled in the NYU Tisch School of the Arts to start studying filmmaking, but music 
had his heart. Even though he was getting more and more involved in the hip-hop community, Punk still held his heart. He was still really passionate about that type of music. So in 1981, he joined with a few friends to create the punk band Hose. He said, quote, I never felt like I was particularly good at any part of it, but I enjoyed it and was passionate about it. End quote. Hose quickly started playing the pretty well-established punk circuit within New York City, even playing with really popular bands like Meat Puppets and Husker Du. So as they were getting more attention, naturally, they wanted to make an album. Hose set up a microphone in an activity room in their dorm and recorded their first record. Then in 1983, they recorded a second time, a single this time, and Rick decided to start a record label in order to release it. He called it Def Jam Records and ran it out of his dorm room with a little funding help from his parents. And aside from starting Def Jam, Rick made another pretty important life-changing decision in college. He decided to stop shaving, and he doesn't really know why he made that decision but he claims that that's why people now consider him a guru because he has this like long beard by this point as you would when you stop shaving when you're 20. Around this time Jazzy J from Universal Zulu Nation taught Rick how to produce hip-hop records and even helped him co-produce his first one the single It's Yours by T. LaRock. Russell Simmons heard that song on the radio and fell in love with it. In the book, Def Jam Records, the first 25 years, Russell said, quote, I had a lot of records on the radio that I produced, but I didn't know that record, and it was the best. The two of them met at a party for the TV show Graffiti Rock, and Russell was really surprised by Rick. Rick didn't look like the kind of guy that would produce a song like It's Yours. They decided to team up and run Def Jam Records together, and the two actually made a really good partnership because Rick had the record label already and also just this deep passion for producing hip-hop records and Russell who was no slouch when it came to producing was really well connected in the community he was already managing his brother's band run DMC so they spent hours in Rick's NYU dorm room just going through different records and singles trying to find rappers that they could sign to their label and produce Their first hip-hop release was LL Cool J's I Need a Beat. LL Cool J's follow-up album, produced by Rick, went platinum. Pretty soon, Rick was venturing further and further outside of the Manhattan hip-hop community looking for other artists to sign. That's how he stumbled upon Public Enemy, who were making a lot of noise out in Long Island and ended up signing them to Def Jam Records. And at that time, in order to be a part of the hip-hop scene, you had to be really involved. Rick was out in the clubs, meeting people being immersed in the music, just becoming a part of the community. He said in a GQ video, quote, people don't remember how hard it was to hear rap music. It was the underground of the underground. It was a tiny subculture, end quote. But it was a subculture that he absolutely loved. Rick talked to Purple Magazine about how much he enjoyed working on those early hip hop records. He said, quote, the early hip hop albums I made were done before samplers or computers were used for recording music. Due to the technological limitations we faced, these earlier records were more handmade than most of the ones made today, but it gave them a more human feel, end quote. Because of his punk roots, Rick was able to meet and befriend a group called the Beastie Boys, who originally started as a punk band, but Rick kind of helped mentor them into becoming a hip-hop group. I have a whole Beastie Boys video if you want more information about them. I'll link it in the description below. But Rick produced their album License to Ill, which became just a smash success. Rick was also the DJ for the Beasties, so he would perform with them, and he went out on tour with them when they were contracted to be the opening band for Madonna's first ever national tour. But Rick had to drop out of the tour when he got an ear infection and was told by doctors that if he flew with that ear infection, he would risk permanent damage to his ears. So he decided that that risk wasn't worth it and he backed out. The Beasties didn't believe him. They didn't think he actually had an ear infection. They thought he just wanted out of the tour. They were already a little bit annoyed with him because of some of the decisions that he made on License to Ill. So it kind of created this long-standing feud and grudge between Rick and the Beasties. Not that that feud really slowed Def Jam down at all. From 1983 to 1988, Rick and Russell and Def Jam produced hit after hit in the hip-hop world and really helped shape the direction of this new musical genre. With Run DMC and LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys and Public Enemy at just 25 and 26 years old, Rick was already one of the biggest producers in America. But in 1988, Rick kind of stepped away from it all and he left New York to go to LA.
At the time, Rick said that he left New York in order to focus on hard rock music since that was his first love and he had kind of gotten away from that in New York. He said in a 1989 interview with the Los Angeles Times, quote, Rock and roll doesn't exist in New York anymore. When you make a rock and roll record in Manhattan, there is nowhere you can hear it on the radio the way you can hear on KNAC. There are also no good venues, no real club scene happening. End quote. But Rick's love of rock music isn't the only reason he left New York for LA. Behind the scenes, his relationship with Russell was crumbling. They had different ideas on how they wanted to move Def Jam Records into the future. Rick, as we talked about, wanted to focus more on rock music. Russell very much did not. He wanted to focus on R&B, which is a genre that Rick never enjoyed. Russell told Hip Hop DX, quote, Well, if he's making Slayer and I'm over here making Orange Juice Jones, where's the common thread? Also in 1988, Lear Cohen was appointed president of Def Jam, and it's kind of believed that he tried to force Rick out. Either way, Rick and Russell went out to dinner one day, and Rick asked if Russell wanted to leave the label. Russell said no. Rick recounted in Def Jam recordings, quote, I was surprised that he cared, and I was also surprised that he didn't say, what's the problem? Let's fix it. In retrospect, I guess I could have asked him the same question. The whole thing is that neither of us had that skill. So I said, then I guess I have to leave the company, end quote. This is just pure speculation on my part, but I also have to believe that part of his reasoning for wanting to go to LA and focus on rock music was the change that was happening in the hip hop culture at that time. Once the music business people saw that there was money to be made in hip hop, that really changed what it was. Rick kind of talked about how at the beginning, anyone doing hip hop was doing it because they loved it. You kind of had to love it to be involved with hip hop. There was really no upside to it, but that all started to change once hit records started to come out and the music industry bigwigs thought, there's something here that we can exploit and monetize. Gotta love money just ruining everything good. But I could see how that changing approach to the hip-hop music scene would make Rick want to step away from it a little bit. I'm sorry if this camera's like going out of- I have no idea what my camera's doing. I apologize. And hopefully it's not that big of an issue. I'll find out in the edit. Once he got out to LA, Rick started a label called Deaf America and started working with bands like Slayer and Danzig and Masters of Reality. And he was living in this apartment above the Sunset Strip and taking full advantage of the rock clubs that were right below him. I say he took full advantage. That might come across wrong. He never did drugs or anything like that. I just meant like he was out seeing the little obscure bands that were coming up through the LA club scene at that point. He also talked about how moving out west helped him connect with the California music scene that had been flourishing since like the Beach Boys. He said that he never understood the Eagles. Their music never connected with him until he was driving through Laurel Canyon and then it kind of clicked and he got it. It's just kind of this idea of like the regionality of music and how each area kind of has their own sound and their own style and even if you're not there by listening to the music of that certain area you can kind of get a feel for what that culture is like and i think that's really cool and special and it's like a unique thing about music that i've always really loved By 1993, Rick realized that the word death had kind of slipped into the mainstream, which to him defeated the purpose of the word entirely, so he changed his label to be called American Recordings. One of American Recordings' most significant additions to the canon of American music started in October of 1992. Rick Rubin went to Bob Dylan's 30th anniversary show at Madison Square Garden, where Johnny Cash was one of the performers. After watching him perform, Rick thought that Johnny Cash had more to offer the music community and that America had kind of unfairly written him off. Johnny had recently turned 60. He was struggling with some health issues. He had been dropped by his longtime label in 1986, and he was just kind of just down and considering retirement from the music industry entirely. Rick befriended Johnny by just hanging out with him and talking about music and hearing his stories of just the incredible things he got to see and do in music. Slowly, they started working on a new Johnny Cash album, which would be Johnny's 81st studio album. It was called American Recordings, and it was released in 1994. They recorded most of it in Johnny's cabin in Hendersonville, Tennessee, without a backing band. They would also record some at Rick's house in LA, but it was mostly just Johnny with his guitar, the way he started. The album was almost universally loved by critics, and Rick's work with Johnny was just 
a beautiful send-off for Johnny's legendary career. One of the best songs to come from this partnership was Johnny's cover of Hurt by Nine Inch Nails, which is often cited as one of the best cover songs of all time. But Johnny originally had no interest in recording it. The way the partnership kind of worked was Rick and Johnny would both come up with songs that they thought might work for the project and they would make these mixed CDs and then send them to each other and then they would listen to them and kind of come up with some songs for Johnny to perform. Whenever Rick sent Johnny Hurt, Johnny just didn't comment on it at all. So with the next batch of songs, Rick sent it again and put it as track number one. Again, Johnny just didn't comment on it. So Rick had to kind of prompt him and be like, but what about track one? I think that would work really well. Rick told the BBC, quote, Johnny just looked at me like I was insane because the Nine Inch Nails version of the song is very noisy, aggressive, and Johnny was wary. End quote. Eventually, Rick was able to show Johnny the arrangement that Rick was envisioning, and that kind of helped Johnny see what the project could be, so he agreed to do it. Rick said that his decision to really push for that song was all about the lyrics. He said, quote, If you listen to the words, forget what Nine Inch Nails sounds like and just read it like a poem, and imagine a 70-year-old man reading these lyrics, it would be profound. Rick also produced some of the final songs by another musical legend, Joe Strummer from The Clash. He produced two songs on Joe's final album. Along with building his stable of artists on American Recordings, which at various times included artists like Tom Petty, The Black Crows, Ghetto Boys, and The Jesus and Mary Chain, Rick was also working as a producer for bands on other labels. Through that, he worked with bands like The Red Hot Chili Peppers, Mick Jagger, Danger Mouse, ACDC, and System of a Down. It's worth noting that not all of the people that he worked with appreciated or liked his input or even enjoyed working with him at all, especially when we get into like the 2000s when his production style became way more hands-off. Corey Taylor said that when Slipknot paid insane money to get Rick to produce their album, Corey saw Rick maybe two times while they were making the album. He said that the current Rick Rubin is a shadow of the producer that he used to be. Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath also said that Rick was not very helpful at all when the band was making their album 13. He said, quote, I still don't know what he did. It's like, yeah, that's good. No, don't do that. And you go, why? And he'd say, just don't do it. He also talked about how Ozzy would get really frustrated and annoyed with Rick's really vague instructions. When Muse was receiving an award, they kind of famously thanked Rick Rubin for teaching them how not to produce. And Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist Josh Klinghoffer said, quote, I will say that in the case of I'm With You, I feel Rick Rubin was way more a hindrance than a help. He told me once, I just want to help the songs be the best they can be. I should have said, well then, get your driver to come and get you, end quote. Rick openly admits that he's not technical in any way. He just knows how to listen really well, and he can craft a good song, and I can understand how that would rub people the wrong way. In 2007, Rick was named co-president of Columbia Records, where he continued to just have success after success. He produced for Linkin Park, Metallica, U2, and Green Day, winning several different awards. Rick left Columbia in 2012 to relaunch American Recordings, where he still produces albums from his home studio called Shangri-La in Malibu. He's talked in recent years about his struggles with depression and how working through a lot of that has helped him feel more grounded and feel like a different person than he was when he was making Fight for Your Right to Party. I think hearing more about that story of how his depression was triggered by some kind of mean things that were said about him by musicians he was working with and how that normally wouldn't have impacted him but for some reason just really cut the rug out from under him and impacted him pretty severely for a long time afterwards is just it helped to kind of humanize him a little bit when I was listening to him tell that story so I'd recommend digging more into that. Well, it's completely fair to say that Rick Rubin probably isn't the producer he once was, and it's maybe even fair to say that he's not as passionate about music as he was in the 80s and 90s. It's also completely fair to say that Rick Rubin played a large role in establishing what America sounded like for the better part of three decades. So much of his work and his ideas and his creativity and his influence impacted what America still sounds like today. And for that, I think he's at least in the conversation for the father of modern American music. Let me know what you think using the comments below. Am I way off base here? What is your opinion? Who would you put in that conversation as well? Be really interested to hear that. Leave 
this video a like if you end up liking it. Subscribe so you don't miss more stories like this from music history. And become a member if you want to tell me what I should cover next.